The eighth Tuesday, we talk about money. The Tuesdays with Maury. I held up the newspaper so that Maury could see it. I don't want my tombstone to read, I never owned a network. Maury laughed and shook his head. The morning sun was coming through the window behind him, falling on the pink flowers of the hibiscus plant that sat on the sill. The quote was from Ted Turner, the billionaire media mogul, founder of CNN, who had been lamenting his inability to snatch up the CBS network in a corporate mega deal. I had brought the story to Maury this morning because I wondered if Turner ever found himself in my old professor's position, his breath disappearing, his body turning to stone, his days being crossed off the calendar one by one. Would he really be crying over owning a network? It's all part of the same problem, Mitch, Maury said. We put our values in the wrong things. <clears throat> and it leads to very delusioned lives. I think we should talk about that. Maury was focused. There were good days and bad days now. He was having a good day. The night before, he had been entertained by a local capella group that had come to his house to perform. And he relayed the story excitingly, as if the ink spots themselves had dropped by for a visit. The ink spots were the uh, band from the sing the song from the famous movie Shawshank Redemption. Um, if I didn't care, <laughs> Maury's love for music was strong even before he got sick, but now it was so intense it moved him to tears. He would listen to opera sometimes at night, closing his eyes, riding along with the magnificent voices as they dipped and soared. You should have heard this group late last night, Mitch. Such a sound. Maury had always been ta taken with simple pleasures, singing, laughing, dancing. Now, more than ever, material things had little or no significance. When people die, you always hear the expression, you can't take it with you. Maury seemed to know that a long time ago. I'm, I'm seeing that me and this guy, Maury, are um, a lot alike in a lot of ways. I think we had a similar upbringing um, where we questioned God and we questioned why we didn't have parents and stuff of that nature. And uh, I can see myself um, in Maury. We've got a lot of form of brainwashing going on in our country, Maury sighed. Do you know how they brainwash people? They repeat something over and over, and that's what we do in this country. Owning things is good. More money is good. More property is good. More commercialism is good. More is good. More is good. We repeat it and have it repeated to us over and over until nobody bothers to even think otherwise. The average person is so fogged up by all this, he has no perspective on what's really important anymore. Whenever I went in my life, I met people wanting to gobble up something new. Gobble up a new car, gobble up a new piece of property, gobble up the latest toy, and then they wanted to tell you about it. Guess what I got? Guess what I got? You know how I always interpreted that? These people were so hungry for love that they were accepting substitutes. They were embracing material things and accepting a sort of a hug back, but it never works. You can't substitute material things for love or for gentleness or for tenderness or for a sense of comradeship. Money is not a substitute for tenderness, and power is not a substitute for tenderness. I can tell you, as I'm sitting here dying, when you most need it, neither money nor power will give you the feeling you're looking for, no matter how much of them you have. I glanced around Maury's study. It was the same today as it had been the first day I arrived. The books held their same places on the shelves. The papers cluttered the same old desks. The outside rooms had not been improved or upgraded. In fact, Maury really hadn't bought anything new except medical equipment for a long, long time, maybe years. The day he learned that he was terminally ill was the day he lost interest in his purchasing power. Purchasing power. So the TV was the same old model. The car that Charlotte drove was the same old model. The dishes and the silverware and the towels, all the same. And yet the house had changed so drastically. It had filled with love and teaching and communication. It had filled with friendship and family and honesty and tears. It had filled with colleagues and students and meditation teachers and therapists and nurses and capella groups and acapella groups and acapella groups and aca and acapella groups. It had become, in a very real, very real way, a very real way, a wealthy home. Even though Maury's bank account was rapidly depleting, 
There's big confusion in this country over what we want versus what we need, Maury said. You need food. You want a chocolate sundae. You have to be honest with yourself. You don't need the latest sports car. You don't need the biggest house. The truth is, you don't get satisfaction from those things. You know what really gives you satisfaction? What? Offering others what you have to give. You sound like a Boy Scout. I don't mean money, Mitch. I mean your time, your concern, your storytelling. It's not so hard. There's a senior citizen center that opened near here. Dozens of elderly people come there every day. If you're a young man or a young woman and you have a skill, you're asked to come and teach it. Say you know computers. You come there and teach them computers. You are very welcome there and they're very grateful. This is how you start to get respect, by offering someone something that you have. It's a good lesson.